All right, amen, amen, everybody. Praise the Lord. God is so good. Amen. If you could just stand with me, we're going to word of prayer, and then we're going to go right into our lesson for the week. Amen. And I'm going to do a recap of what I started in chapter 5 in the book of Beta Satan. I'm going to do a recap on that and then pick up where we are tonight in the lesson. So, Lord God, we thank you for your blessing, health, and strength. We thank you for your goodness and mercy bestowed upon us. We thank you for your divine favor, Lord, at least upon all of our lives, oh God. Tonight, God, give us wisdom, insight, and understanding of the word of God that will change our lives, oh God, forever. And we just give you praise, oh God, that chains are being broken, shackles are being loosed, oh God, that people's minds are being transformed by the spirit of the living God. We give you glory, give you honor, give you praise, oh God, because if it had not been for you, God, we would have never made it this far. But by faith, we come, oh God, to say thank you, thank you, thank you for loving us and caring for us, oh God, and give us, Father God, a heart to want to serve you, even in Bible study. Lord, speak to our hearts, oh God. Make our hearts receptive to receive the word of God that you have spoken that will help transform our lives and become better for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight, those who came to participate in the lesson tonight, even for our pastor giving us the opportunity to do this. It's such a blessing, and I've been doing this for two years from home. Yeah. Two years from home, doing a live stream for weekly Bible class. And I tell you, it's, it's been wonderful, because there's been several people that follow me on Facebook from my account. And we also want to just um, thank um, God for the church allowing us to even happen because we couldn't have did it without the church. Yeah, you know, yeah. a lot of people do see the lessons later on. They may not be on at this time, but they will see it later on. And some people, you know, contact me regarding the lessons and it, it give me just an encouraging word of how it changed their lives. I, I don't know about you, but it changed your mind every day. The more I study this word and, and teach this lesson from the book, The Bait of Satan, Living Free from the Deadly Trap of Offense that I had had on my head, God bless me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. I wonder what I had in the house of God. Amen. But um, one of the key scriptures is 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24. If you have your Bible to get you tonight, go to 1 Samuel chapter 24. First Samuel, chapter 24. All right. And y'all bear with me as I find this nifty new Bible up here. Glory to God. In verse 6 and 7. Verse 6 and 7. All right. In verse 6 and 7 it says, And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do a thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, Seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Amen. Verse 7. So David stayed his servant with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. And when you read the story, you find out that Saul was jealous because God appointed David to be the next king. And because Saul had, had lost his anointing, David still even respect him because he said, this is God's anointing. And, and what it is is that when Saul got mad, he decided to chase David to kill him. You know? And he, every way he went, he tried to find him, catch him on him, and kill him. But God always made a way for David to escape. So David escaped many, many times when Saul had the opportunity to take his life. God kept making a way to escape. So not only after that, he escaped. He went and hid in the cave. And when he's hiding in the cave, Saul was pursuing after David, and they came to the same cave where David was hiding. Isn't that something? Came to the same cave where David was hiding from Saul, because he knew Saul was after him. And Saul had about 3,000 men coming after him. You know, so it's like crazy how he had all these people for one man. You know, but then not only that, Saul and his men laid down to go to sleep. So David has some servants with him who try to encourage him to take retaliation in his hand. Because that's what it's all about, getting retaliation. And David said, no, I can't touch him because that's God's anointing. 
You know, one thing God showed me when I started studying this book, The Bait of Satan, is that many times when God has a call upon your life, there will be some jealous folk. Because of the anointing of your life, there are going to be some folks who are going to hate on you and try to assassinate your purpose, assassinate your character, assassinate your life, because they're jealous. Yeah. And I found out being in ministry for 38 years, there have been folk who were jealous of the anointing on my life. I haven't done anything to anybody, but because of who I am and the life I present before people all the time, folk find a reason of, on themselves to hate you. And you haven't done anything against them, so they're looking for a way to make you stop doing what you're doing. And that's the whole purpose. We started out talking about how spiritual vagabonds are born. And a vagabond is a person that's unsettled, they're always on the run, don't have a home, they're always begging, they're messy, they're filthy in their minds and in their hearts. And God, when I study this, God will show me, he says, David had the right, if he wanted to, to kill Saul. But he didn't because he knew Saul was God's anointed. And that's one thing about it. You have folk in the house of God will always try to find a reason to assassinate your pastor. They always want to spread rumors in the house. That's a fire that my spirit. It's a tail bearer. It's people who don't care about nobody else but themselves. So anything I can do to stop you from being who you are in the kingdom of God, I want to stop you best I can. So they spread rumors. No, it ain't true. They make up stuff about you because they spread that wildfire. Anytime somebody tell a lie about anybody in the house of God, and somebody don't believe that lie. Yeah. They ain't got no proof, no evidence, nothing to validate what they're talking about, the lie that it's not created. Mm -hmm. So they do everything in their power to get you to defame your name in the house of God. Amen. We have to know for ourselves who we are and whose we are. We can't allow people to discourage us, even though we have discouraging moments. We are most feel like giving up, we get tired, we get frustrated, we get weary, and we feel like, where is God? How many times have you felt like that? Where is God when I need him the most? It's, I heard this preacher say on Sunday. He said, many times we're praying, we're looking for God to answer us. And he said, many times it seems like God is silent. Yeah. But he said, that's the best time God is moving in your life, when he's silent. Mm -hmm. You can't see it because you're looking through the carnal eyes and not through the spiritual eyes. And when God began to show me that the important is to always have a spiritual outlook on life. Any questions or comments, anybody? Okay? So I read this, uh, this passage in the book. It says, in the last chapter, we saw how David was mistreated, mistreated by the man he had hoped to, would be his father. He was talking about Saul. David kept trying to understand where he had gone wrong. What had he done to turn his heart, heart, Saul's heart against him? And how could he win him back? He, 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 uh, he proved his loyalty by sparing Saul's life, even though Saul aggressively pursued his. How many times can we do that? We know people coming after us. They're looking for a way to find a foothold in your life, to hurt you, to scandalize your name, to ridicule you. And yet, we're saying, God, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything to deserve this. Why is this happening to me? David should David felt the same way. Like, why is Saul trying to kill me? I didn't do anything wrong. I served him. And you know the story of David. When, when Saul had an evil spirit came upon him, he sent for the servant to go find someone who would play some music. Yeah, sure. <laughs> right? Yeah. And he found David. They said, oh, well, it's a shepherd boy at Jesse's house. He, he's a musician. He, and he said, bring him to me. And he said, David will play the harp. He will calm the spirit, right? So the thing is, God's way of dealing with your enemies is not the way we want to deal with it. And when God showed me, he said, you know what? You're not going to deal with the enemy the way I want you to deal with them if you walk in the flesh. Amen. If you walk in the spirit, the Lord says, and this stuck in my spirit, vengeance is mine, 
said the Lord, I will repay. So if I leave the vengeance and the retaliation up to God, God can do more to your enemy than what you can do with yourself. We always try to find a way to fix our issues with other people when folks are hurting us. And God says, sometimes be silent. I found out being in ministry, my silence is a weapon. My silence is a weapon against the enemy. Because if I don't speak all the time, guess what? They don't know how I'm coming. They're looking for you to get out of character. They're looking for you to act up. They're looking for you to give them a piece of your mind. Right? So when God, he just spoke this to me, he said, you know what? Sometimes your greatest weapon is silence. That's why Proverbs 15 and 1, it says, a soft answer turneth away wrath. But grievous words, that's those hostile words, those angry words, is their anger. He cried out to Saul with his head bowed to the ground, seeing that there is neither, nor, neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you. And this is David told us all. So once David knew he had shown his loyalty to his leaders, his mind was at ease. So now he's saying, now the requirement is taken off of me and put back on God. So I can let God do what Saul did what I can do for myself. In Romans chapter 12, verse 19, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Amen? Mm -hmm. So God has a way of making your enemy become your footstool. Yes, so if I leave the retaliation to God, mm -hmm. even though I might be hurt, I might be angry, and I say, God, you know what? They don't really make me mad, God. I, I just want to really go off on them. I just want to just tell them what's on my mind because they done stepped on my toes too many times. I, I, I did everything to do. God, I done prayed for them. I done fasted. I done consecrated. But yet, God, they keep on picking at me. How many of you have somebody picking at you right there? They just keep on coming at you. You do everything right, but they keep on coming at you. And you're like, but God, I didn't do nothing wrong. It is righteous for God to avenge his servants. It is unrighteous for God's servants to avenge themselves. Amen. So if I tell God, God, Mabel did this to me, or Jones did this to me, then God will leave me in your hands to deal with it. So God said, you know what? I have a way of breaking them down make them come back to repent. Mm -hmm. Because the thing that God looks for more from anyone that hurts you it's a repentful heart. That's what he looked for. And it says, Saul was a man who avenged himself. He chased David, a man of honor, for 14 years and murdered the priests and their families. Ain't that something? That's wicked. You're going to kill innocent people because you're mad about this one person you can't catch. Ain't that something? He couldn't catch David, so I'm going to take my anger out for everybody else. So, we're going to move on a little further. Mm -hmm. God tests his servants with obedience. God tests his servants with obedience. He deliberately places us in situations where standards of religion and society would appear to justify our actions. So, in other words, what it's saying here, there are some fire. God will put you in. Yeah. Some situation you cannot avoid no matter how much you try. All right. All right. I found out something, and this is, is so true. The Bible says, do not be hasty to become angry. Angry. Mm -hmm. For anger rests in the bosom of fools. Right? Yes. The reason why, because I get angry. This is how I used to be. Back when I was younger, I was hot-headed. I demand a new revenge. And God had to teach me through the years of ministry that your hot headedness creates more problems. Mm -hmm. And one thing about it, when I learned how the words that humble myself in the sight of the Lord, He will lift you up. Mm -hmm. 
So when I learned how to cause this flesh, as Paul said, to buffet it, to beat it daily to the middle. Because if you don't beat yourself down in a place where it's trying to rise up and overpower you, you give way to the flesh to come against people that God intended to come against. So when I learned how to allow God to deal with my anger, I said I have more self-control. The fruit of one of the fruit of the spirit is self-control. Temperance, meekness, gentleness, forbearance, long suffering. Right? Why? Because if I have the Holy Spirit in control of my actions, then I'm going to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. He's going to, be going to tell me, don't get angry, go pray. You know, I find myself doing a lot of times when I find some angry people. I go home, I find my, my best worship music I love to hear. And I go into a place of worship. And I begin to pray. I said, Lord, my heart is troubled, my mind is, is confused, and I'm mad. Give me peace. Put on that worship, it changed the whole atmosphere. Because I come in with a bad attitude. I, had, I remember I, I said a few years ago, a couple years ago, a young man in my building made me so upset, but I never showed it. Because a lot of times, you don't have to act out the way they come at you. And I was talking about what David said. He could have took the in his hand against Saul, but he acted righteously. Yeah. He acted in a manner that God wanted him to behave. So he went to God with his complaint. And he found God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Mm -hmm. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord, strengthen my life and shall be afraid. Why? Because he wrote the psalm when he was in going through situations. And the more he went through things, the more he prayed about it, and he wrote about it, he made songs about it. So God deliberately puts it in places to calm our spirit. He allows others, especially those close to us, to encourage us to protect ourselves. And that's something. Because your family will say, you ain't got to take that from that person. You ain't got to take that from the way they treated you. Or you treat your loved one, you ain't got to settle for that. No, protect yourself, protect your family. You go take the revenge in your hand. And the Holy Spirit said, Nope, just rest. Leave it in my hand. I'm going to deal with it. When I consider opportunity for, for I said, let me read a little bit of this book. I read the book a lot, and then I explain it. It says, We may think we will be noble and protect others by avenging ourselves. But it's not God's way. It's the way of the world's wisdom. That's a very vital point. Mm -hmm. You may think you're acting noble <laughs> by taking the situation in your hand and thinking the way you want to. But it's not the way of God's wisdom. Because wisdom will give you instruction and give you a way to deal with your adversary the way God would deal with them. Yes, the reason why Jesus, and I love the story when Jesus was in the wilderness and the devil came to test him. And he said, it is written. Man shall not leave my bread alone, but it will be my God, right? Because everything he tested with was something the flesh loved. And God told me something recently. I was listening to a pastor, and he says, Satan only presents to you a tailor-made sin that's going to appease your flesh. Because he knows what you love the most and he knows what's going to grab to your attention. So what he does, he'll take the things that your flesh wants to draw you or bait you. Yeah. Now, I love this book because many baits have been played before a godly child. No matter where you go, it's something going to bait you. But it's up to you to either receive it or reject it. Well, I remember what I was preaching a while ago about the Psalms 23rd book. And I was talking about how the Lord prepared the table before us in the presence of our enemy, right? Yeah. Then it goes and he anoints your head with oil, your cup overflow, right? Mm -hmm. Satan sets the table for you too. Amen. We don't think about that. 
Psalm 23 tells you the God side of things. Yeah. But the opposite of that is the table Satan sets before you with all the delicacies the flesh loves. Yes, yes. And he sets that on purpose because he you knows I can lure you to bait you away from serving God. I can win the battle. Right. But my Bible tells me that greatest is in me than in the world. So if I have the greater one living inside of me, guess what? I'm about to go to this table. I can reject this table and sit at God's table because his battle with me is love. Come on. Yes. And that's what it says. His battle is love. Then it goes on. It says, when I consider the opportunity I have for exposing leaders over me, I remember wrestling with the thought that he might hurt others if he was not exposed. And this is dealing with corrupt leaders. And so I kept thinking, I'm only reporting truth. Check this out. I'm only reporting truth. If I don't, how would it ever end? I was encouraged by others to expose. This, this is the story. I'm going to go back a little bit and tell you what it's talking about. The author of this book, he was saying that he, he was in a church and it was a corrupt leader. And he had the opportunity to expose him. And he wrestled with the thought over and over in his mind that if I don't do something about this, many people are going to get hurt. We all do it in, in today's time. We, we feel like if there's somebody in the church not doing right, it's your responsibility to expose them. That's a lie from the devil. Amen. That's a lie from the devil. Because this man was telling us that he had the opportunity, but the Holy Spirit would let him do it. And when he listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit, the man ended up leaving the church himself after exposing himself. And that's what God does. God has a way, as I mentioned before, deal with your adversaries better than what you can deal with them. He'll make them expose themselves right before the whole church and they leave. Because vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Today, however, I know that God gave me information for a reason to test to test me. Was I going to become like the man who sought to destroy me, or would I allow God's judgment or mercy if the man repented? Because that's what God looks for out of everybody's life is repentance. How can God use corrupt leaders? I talked about this a few weeks ago. So many people ask, why does God put people under leaders? who make serious mistakes, and even some that are weak? That's a question. Anybody got a comment on that? Why would God put you on a corrupt leader? Anybody? Anybody? Go ahead. To test you. Because I've been in many ministries where bishops were adulterated, apostles adulterated, fornication, among leaders, all these I've been in those type of churches. And many times, it vexed my spirit. And the only thing God told me to do was pray. Don't say nothing, just pray about it. And when the opportunity came to speak a prophetic word, I spoke a word from the Lord, which convicted the whole house. Because God has a way of using you when you're humble. The key word is humility. When you humble yourself before the Lord, the Lord would cause you to speak a word in the end time that will help change somebody's life and cause them to repent. Yes. I've seen it happen many times. Look at the childhood of Samuel. First Samuel chapter 2 through chapter 5. God, not the devil, was the one who put this young man under the authority of a corrupt priest named Eli. And his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who were priests as well. These men were very wicked. They took offering by manipulation. For and forth, they committed fornication with the women who were civil at the door of the tabernacle. That's how corrupt they were. Yeah. Didn't regard God at all. I'm going to steal the sacrifices for myself. I'm going to rape the women at the entrance of the temple. So I'm going to do everything I want to do because I've been begging by Satan to do it. That's sad. But it happened. Yes. Still happens today. Yes. Because people are still robbing God. Mm -hmm. They're still doing the things God told them not to do in the house of God. 
When God told, told uh, Amos, he said, right, he said, right, tell the people to sit in their ways. So why is my house mine empty and your house is full? He said, I blew on your money, I made your pocket like hole, all of the things God spoke. Why? Because he's letting us know that when you become corrupt in the house of God, you're not going to get away with it. Can you imagine if you were serving a minister who lived this kind of life? A minister who was so insensitive to the things of his spirit that he couldn't recognize a woman in prayer and accused her of being drunk. You remember the story? Hannah was praying to God for a child and she was crying out, mouth moving, no words coming out. Eli thought she was drunk. That's what he's talking about. Eli, the priest, should have had discernment of the Spirit of God to know if this woman was drunk or not. But because he had lost his connection with God, he assumed she was drunk. And it's sad because when you get that type of mindset, you're single-minded. You don't care about nothing else but accusing folk of something that's not true. He accused her of being drunk. He said, no, I'm not drunk. I'm just crying out to God. You know the story. She cried to God because she wanted a child. And then when he asked what's going on, she told him. He, he prayed for it to buy his time that he would a child. Why? Because God now opened his eyes to listen in the ears to hear a voice. He heard her prayer and came to agree with her prayer and God answered that prayer. Then he goes on and says, So flesh me that he grossly was overweight, so compromising that he did nothing about his sons whom he had appointed as leaders who were committing fornication right in the church. Most Christians today would be offended and search for another church, telling others as they went of this wicked lifestyle of the former pastor and his leaders. In the midst of such corruption, I love, so I love the report of what young Samuel did. Now the boy suddenly ministered before the Lord, uh, before Eli. But the corruption took its toll. The word of the Lord was rare in those days, and, and there was no widespread of revelation. Because during this time, God seemed silent. And that's what it's talking about. No revelation. Eli had lost his relationship with God because he wasn't walking in the authority God told him to take to command of his children, to control his house to stop the sons from being wicked from her now to God. So the word of the Lord was rare in those days God wasn't speaking. Then it goes on, it says the Lamb of God was about to go out in the temple of the Lord, yet did Samuel go look for another place to worship. God was moving his presence. So it says the Lamb of God was going out. God moved his presence. When God's Lamb started going out of your life, you need to check yourself, because something's wrong with the relationship. And when he said the lamp was going out, one thing about Samuel, Samuel knew this, but he said, no, i got to find a place to worship God. So Samuel looked for a place to worship. Did he go to the elders to expose the weakness of Eli and his sons? Did he form a committee for Eli and his sons out of the pastorage? No, he ministered to the Lord. He continued to be devoted to the Lord in spite of knowing all the mess Eli and the sons were doing in the house. Mm. That's devotion. Mm -hmm. We as God's people got to be devoted to our God under any circumstance. That's right. mm. We have to continue. If nobody else want to do right in the house, you do right. That's what I got from this. When I read this a while ago, I said, so if nobody else want to be devoted to the Lord in integrity and uprightness for God, I need to do it. Because I'm not here for anybody else. I'm here to worship God. And guess what? Every individual who walked through the house of God and through those doors are held accountable for their own life before God. The shepherds of the house have responsibility to teach the congregation how to live a devoted life to God. Mm -hmm. Ain't that awesome? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. We have responsibility. Mm -hmm. Then it goes on. God had 
place Samuel did. He was not responsible for the behavior of Eli and his son. He was put under them not to judge them, but to serve them. That's a key point for every believer in the house of God. You're not placed there to judge anybody in the house of God. Just because you know their secrets, you know their mess ups, you know their habits, you know their addictions, you're not there to judge them. You are there to encourage them, to serve them. Jesus said, anyone that desires to be greatest in the kingdom must be a servant. That is so powerful. So God puts him to serve. He knew Eli was God's servant, not his. He knew that God was quite capable of dealing with his own. Yes, he is. Hear what I said? Yes. God has a responsibility, and he's careful to deal with his own when they're out of order. Amen. God had placed Samuel there. He was responsible. He was not responsible for his behavior. Children do not direct their fathers. But it's the duty of the fathers to train and correct the children. Mm -hmm. We are to deal with, the, with and confront those whom God has given us to train. Mm -hmm. This is our responsibility. Those on our own level, we are encouraged to exhort our brothers and sisters. And one thing about that is that people look for a weakness. They look for your weakness. Mm -hmm. When they find a weakness in your life, they look for an opportunity to tear you down instead of build you up. Mm -hmm. I've been broke down so, for so long when I was young in ministry. I would go to different places, ministry, different churches. No one wanted to use me. They just step on me because I, I wasn't in the big league like everybody else. But one thing I learned was humility. Mm -hmm. Because when God started doing my heart, don't get mad about it because nobody uses you because it's not your time. When you might be in the house of God, sitting in a certain position, and you feel like, why do you keep overstepping me? How come they're not calling my name? How come they're not elevating me? It's not your time. When your time presents itself, and God has a season of elevation, no matter who tries to get in the way, they can't stop you from elevating. Samuel was one who was humble, being taught and trained by Eli the priest to serve the Lord. And one thing about it, he did not allow the behavior of Eli the son to stop him from serving the Lord. And we you know the story how God called Samuel three times, and he thought it was Eli each time. And then the fourth time he said, Lord, can I have your servant that's listening? Why? Because we got to be in a position where I can hear God's voice speaking to me. And I can obey his voice to do what he tells me to do. Last week I talked about churches aren't cafeterias. Churches aren't cafeterias. You know one thing about it, when you're in the church, people pick and choose the reason why they want to go to church. They pick and choose where they gonna go to church at, what they gonna do in church. You might be a great singer, but don't have no anointing. Mm -hmm. But they choose, I'm gonna sing, cause I can sing, but I'm not anointed. Mm -hmm. So I just got a talent, I got a gift. But one thing I learned, any gift in the house of God, God anoints. Mm -hmm. Only when you are listening mm -hmm. to his voice. The key point is listening to God's voice and obeying his voice. So God says, you go to this church, you be a praise dancer. You learn the best you can about being a praise dancer and you do it to your full ability. Guess what? God anoints that. He elevates that. And people get blessed by it because of the anointing on your life. You might be the greatest preacher, have no anointing. Until you humble yourself, say, God, here I am. I know I'm not, not doing what you told me to do, God, but I want you to help me to do what's right. Yeah. I repent of serving you, God, half-hearted. Mm -hmm. I was one of them. Serve God half-hearted. Guess what? What's going on with it? Until I learn, as the word says, those who come to take communion, so for this reason, many are sickly and dead. Because they ate and partake of the Lord's body unworthily. Right. 
Many times I could have been dead for being unworthy. All right, come on. But because of grace, All right, yes, God spared my life and gave me another chance yes. to get it right. Yes. And that's what he does with all of us as his children. So when I come to the church, I can't come to church and say, I just want this part of the church, but I want that part. Church might be deficient in an era where you fit in the most. But because you pick it and choose it, the error you want to serve, not what God wants you to do. Mm-hmm. Right. There's no anointing. Yes. Until you get in the right place. I remember a pastor I heard a few, a few weeks ago. He was in Gary at my father's church. He was talking about a post. Our lives are like a post. Mm-hmm. He says, when you lay the pieces out, you don't know what fits where. Right. Because they all scramble. Yeah. But then he says, as you begin to get a vision from the box, because the box has a picture on it of what it's supposed to look like. Right? So you buy a puzzle box. You see the picture. And you say, okay, this puzzle looks like this. You take every piece. Take you some time to put those pieces in place. But they only going to fit where they're supposed to fit. You can't fit a square in a circle. You can't fit an octagon in a triangle, right? right? So every piece of that puzzle fits where it's uniquely been designed to fit. He said the body of Christ is the same way. Amen. Every person is a piece of the puzzle. God got the master puzzle piece already displayed. Yeah. He says every piece in this puzzle is going to fit because I uniquely designed you to fit the place I want you to be in the body of Christ. And he says, an anointing comes upon your life because of the willingness to be obedient, to fit where God wants you to be. So I can't come in the house of God and let it be a cafeteria to say, oh, I don't want the vegetables, but I don't want the soup. I don't want the meat, but I don't want the vegetables. So I can't come out to God and say, God, I want this part. I want to hear the word, but I want to hear anybody's testimonies. I don't want to hear anybody singing. I want to... You got people to do that. Yeah, Some people will come to church just to hear word. They come at the right time to go to speak on get up. I see they have a lot growing up. People won't come to church until they come to the part they want to hear. Some will come just to the music. And when the music is done, they get believe. Because they're like, I can't trust them, just music. So I'm picking you. And that's what we do at God's house. We pick and choose, and we, we take the buffet and say, God, I want this part of the buffet, but I don't want that part. So I do what I want to do in the body of Christ, and God said, nope, it ain't going to work that way. Everything that I display for you, you have to get what I want you to have. Not what you want, but what I want you to have. Right? Amen. Today, men and women leave church so ready if they see something wrong in leadership. Perhaps it is the way the pastor takes it off. Maybe it's the way money is spent. If they don't like what the pastor preaches, they leave. He is either, a, a pro, he is either not approachable or he is too familiar. Mm-hmm. Ain't that something? Yeah. And that's the way people look at leadership. They look at certain leaders in their kind of category and say, well, they're not approachable, so I ain't going to talk to them. So as soon as church, I believe them. I've been in church like that with pastors used to be so humble before they got real big. And now that they're big, they got bodyguards, they got the secret service, they got all this in the house of God. And I'm not going to let you get near me. So if you need to speak to me, talk to my bodyguard. So they can set a point for the secretary. The secretary set a point for you to come see me. So the whole chain of command has changed. So the same pastor that you used to be able to just walk up to any time and talk to him and say, Pastor, it's a good work that I appreciate what you did, what you said. You can't do that no more. Because they changed their status. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? They changed their status. Right, my God. When God changed your status, you're still humble. Yeah. You're still approachable. Yeah. I might have a big go ahead. Exactly. <laughs> that is so true. That is so true. And you're humble. To enough to where people can still approach you. So even though I've got millions of people in my church, I like where I'm comfortable. I like watching me every Sunday. This man, the Caucasian brother, began to be so humble. 
He could gather the people. Be a different culture. He's not going to turn me away. Come, I got to talk to people. Now I don't want you coming here. This man, so he comes down to meet the people himself. Church is over. He's still talking to people. That's how, how we're supposed to be. We're not supposed to get so high and mighty. Well, I can't come to you and you can't come to me. So they set up their own false protection. I talked about this before in previous lessons, how we set up a false protection wall. And many people hide behind a false protection wall. And I'm not going to let you get in until I want you to come in. So I come to the house of God week after week, just broken and torn and hurt, and I come to church with a smile on my face, but my heart is jacked up. Because I got my protection wall to cover me, so I won't be hurt anymore by other people. All right, come on. And God is saying, no, I need to break that wall. I need to bring the spiritual jackhammer. I need to bring it in and tear that, that foundation up. I need to bring that wrecking ball, bring it in and tear that wall. Yeah. And guess what? He does that when we humble ourselves yeah. in the sight of the Lord. Let's face it. Jesus is the only perfect pastor. So why do we run from difficulties in America instead of facing them and working with them? When we don't hit these contents head on, we usually leave offended. That's the whole book of Bay of Satan is about being offended. You don't have that book, get that book. It's a really good book to have in your library. The Bay of Satan. Because there's so many things that it enlightens your, your vision and your eyes to see and hear from the Spirit of God to change your life. So when we face difficulties, and you face them head on, you won't be offended. Because the Holy Spirit gives you wisdom and knowledge and understanding how to deal with difficulties. That's true. Many times when conflicts arise, we get mad about it. We don't want to deal with it. We leave mad. We leave church mad. Pastor Matt says to me, I leave church mad. I'm mad at him. Why do you say to me? I wonder who he think he is. You know, I know he's the pastor. That's the out by his attitude. He didn't repent. How many times are people like that? People do it all the time. Yeah. All because they take you wrong. You may not even meant any harm for what you said to certain people, but they took it wrong. Yeah. And they leave offended and never deal with it. So it's a broken scar in their hearts now. Yeah. 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 Until I recognize the root cause of the offense. And that's what God been teaching me reading this book. There's a cause and there's an effect. You may have said something to me that caused me to become angry. But the effect, if I don't deal with it, it makes me more angry. So anyone comes to my life, I treat everybody the same way. So we got to deal with our conflicts here on. He goes and says, as I write this book, I've been a member of two, only two churches in two different states in the last 14 years. I have more than two. In fact, numerous opportunities become offended with leadership over, over me, most of which I might add stem from my own fault and immaturity. Mm -hmm. Ain't that something? Yeah. So, I might have come to be offended in April, but really, I'm the problem. She's not the problem. Right. She came with a prophetic word and told me that God says he's about to change your life, oh, did you repent? I get mad at her. Why should she think she's talking to? She don't know me. You know, and so I'm mad at her. I'm offended what she said to me. Not, not realizing, if I look in the mirror of the word, the word says, as a man beholds up in the looking glass, he sees what man or man he is. Right? So I can look in the mirror of the word. I can see what God says about me. If I don't deal with that flesh, when I look into the mirror of the word, the flesh tells me to get offended. So I carry the offense. I become a tail bearer. I carry the offense from person to person to person. Never deal with the offense. So now I got all the folks mad about something they got to do. I make folks mad for something they got to do. All because I got to think about Trying to spread gossip about April or something she said to me, because I'm mad at her. So I tell everybody, don't like her. Don't talk to her. She don't know what she's talking about. She's going to tell you something that ain't going to hurt you. Why? Because I got her. 
And one thing I learned growing up, my mama told me this, hurt people hurt people. And that's a true statement. I'm hurt because you hurt me, I go hurt her, she go hurt her, you get hurt, you get hurt, so we all hurt. So it's in the house of God, all hurt. Nobody ain't healed. Right. Nobody repent. Right. Nobody ain't delivered. Right. So man, in the midst of very trying circumstances, one day the Lord spoke to me through the scriptures and first and said, this is the way I want you to leave the church. You should go out with joy and be led forth with peace. Yes. Anytime you leave a church, any place you are, do you feel like it's time for you to leave that place? You need to go out with joy and be led forth with peace. Don't leave a church because it may offend you. It boils down to that message. Do not leave the house of God offended. If God says your season is up in a certain place, I've been in there with God to from place to place, and I'll be elevated each place I went. I receive more wisdom, more knowledge, more insight, more understanding, learn how about my character, learn about my mindset, learn about my attitude. I learn how to be the man of God God wanted me to be. Even a husband, I didn't know how to be a husband like a man. And I had to learn this through trial and, and error. Yeah. I had nobody teach me until I got other apostles and bishops who started teaching me and growing me how to be the man God wanted me to be. Mm -hmm. I was jacked up. Mm -hmm. Keep it real. I was jacked up mm -hmm. until God sent the right people in my life mm -hmm. to show me who I am in the mirror of the word. Mm -hmm. And guess what? God changed my life. Most do not lead this way. They think churches are like cafeterias. They pick and choose what they like. They feel the freedom to stay as long as there is no problem. Mm. Come on. So you stay in the church because there ain't no problem. That's what you feel. Mm -hmm. So when a problem arrives, it's time to bad shit. Mm -hmm. We can't do that. I remember the story. I heard this preacher talking about Sunday in my father's church for the anniversary. They were talking about how when Paul was on the ship and it was going to take him to sea, right? And there came a storm and then Paul got a word, the ship was going to be destroyed. Everybody was in the when the storm came, right? Mm -hmm. And God told me, he said, the ship's going to be destroyed, but everybody going to be saved. So he told the commander, the, the one who's in charge, who's an expert in dealing with storms, he told him, he said, you know what, don't you worry about this. Everything's going to be all right. Everybody will survive. Now one soul will be gone. Everybody can until he got a word from God and told him what to do, the ship, of, of course, was shipwrecked, mm -hmm. and many men survived on broken pieces. Mm -hmm. Broken pieces. Hold on to broken pieces so they won't drown. Some could swim, some couldn't. And then the soldiers like, you know what, let's kill all the, 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 the prisoners, because if any one of them escaped, we're going to lose all of them. <laughs> Why? Because of fear. Mm -hmm. But Saul, Paul told him, he said, don't worry about it. Not one going to be missing. And guess what? God fulfilled his word when not one of the prisoners escaped. Mm -hmm. And they came to the island of Eden, and they gathered the island, and they were right there in that place every last one of them. But they survived on broken pieces. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Which shows us that even in the midst of conflict, yes. when storm arrives in your life, yes. if you trust God, even though you may have some broken pieces, God still has a way of causing you to escape without arms. All right. Yes, he does. I was talking to a young man just yesterday, and I was sharing with him about how when you come to Christ, how when you have problems arise in your life, mm -hmm. God teaches you how to deal with them mm -hmm. in a godly manner. He changed your attitude. I watched this young man from about a year ago. When I first met him, I started ministering to him. And I watched his life turn because he, he lived, I lived in salvation, gave life to Jesus, and he had his, his habits and things he was doing. He said, but the more I kept talking to him, he kept coming to me with his, his issues. And he would pour into my heart his issues. And I said, let's pray. Pray with him. Just yesterday, I was talking to him, and I said, you know what? I thank God for meeting you because I'm a witness of how God turned your life around. He said, I, I thank you because he said, I couldn't have did it without you. Yeah. I said, thank God. You know, I said, I thank God for being a willing vessel. He said, I got somebody else you talk to too. 
So he's trying to connect with other people, talk to them too about the salvation, turn their life around. Yeah. So, and I tell myself, but you know what? When problems arise, I said, your attitude change. The, the way you used to be, carrying God, and deal with it the way you want to. I said, look what God done. He changed your whole attitude. So when people make you mad now, what you do? You go pray about it. Yeah. And that's what he does. He prays about conflicts when they arise. Then it goes on. It says, but does this, listen, but this does not agree at all with what the Bible teaches. Tell me, I take it from you, don't matter. You are not the one who chooses where to go to church. God does. The Bible's going to say, God said, the members, each one of them, in the body as they please. Rather, it says, but God now said, the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18. Then he said, remember, you're in the place where God wants you, not the devil. The devil trying to offend you to get you out of what God has placed you in. Right. And that's what he does. He wants you to offend. Because he knows in a certain place, every individual in the house of God got placed there for a reason. Some to give, some to be servants, some to be leaders, some to be singers, some to be worshipers, some to be dancers. Every part plays its role in the body of Christ. And he says, God says it as he pleases to glorify him. So you can't decide, well, I'm not going to do what God wants me to do because I don't feel I want to do it. Well, if I came to church, I don't feel I want to preach. Pastor, I didn't preach. I don't want to do that. I don't feel like I want to preach that. I don't feel like I want to do this. When I know God called me, I know God qualified me, I know God anointed me to do that, that job in the mission. Mm -hmm. Paul says, Ephesians 4 and 1, he said, therefore, my brother, I beseech you, you know, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation, yeah. what would he not be called? So your job, whatever your assignment is in the body of Christ, God said he placed you in the body as he pleased to glorify him. And many times, it wants to test you to see what your response is going to be to get you out of the will of God. He wants us to uproot men and women from the place God has planted them. If he can get you out, he has been successful. His M.O., his mission order is to pull you out of your position. God has placed you in the body of Christ. He can pull you out of it. It's the day you would find yourself running with what God called you to do. Then you get into rebellion. Then you become stubborn. Then you become prideful. Come arrogant. Come haughty. And God said, I called you. I qualified you. For you being born in mother's womb, I knew you. So everything we're called to do in the body of Christ, God says, guess what? I set you up for it. And I know what conflict you're going to deal with, you're going to rise in your life, I know the problems are going to come, I know that the issues are going to come, but you continue to trust me because I'm going to deal with it all in my way. That's right. Not your way, his way. Yeah. When, he, when you let him deal with it, he said there's a way to see right to the man but he ended up death. So when I try to fix it my way, I leave myself a path with death. For I tell God, God, you told me, be not deceived, God does not mock. Mm -hmm. What's a man sow is that she also reap. Mm -hmm. So if I sow corruption, I'll reap corruption. But if I sow righteousness, I'll reap righteousness. Amen. So God, this is what's going on. I'm going to leave it in your hand, God, that you will deal with it. If you are not budge, even amidst the great conflicts, you spoil the plan and the will of the enemy. He already said, if you leave the judgment, the retaliation in the hands of God, mm -hmm. when Satan tries to test you, you're not going to be it. You're not going to bow. You're not going to give up. You're not going to throw it in town. Yeah. You're going to continue to stand, as the word says, with the full arm of God yeah. to quench the fire of God to the enemy. And that's what we have to do continue to stand on the word and trust God that his word will come to pass in our lives. Another subject in this chapter, how spiritual values are, are born, is the critical deception. We've talked about a little bit about this and we're fin finishing in a couple of weeks. We're going to do it again. I'm going to start on, on next week. I'll do it online with the same subject, the critical deception. So I was in the church for several years. The pastor was one of the best preachers in America. When I first attended that church, 
I will sit with my mouth open wide in awe of the biblical teaching that came from his mouth. As time passed, because of my position of serving the pastor, I was close enough to see his flaws. I questioned some of his ministry decisions. I became critical and judgmental. An offense set in. He preached, and I was sitting, and I sensed no inspiration or anointing. His preaching no longer ministered to me. Why? Because I saw his flaws. I saw the leader's mistakes. So I allowed myself to become offended. Another couple who were, were our friends and also some of the staff were being discerning of the same thing. God sent them out from the church and they started their own ministry. They asked us to go with them. They knew how we, was, we were struggling. They encouraged us to get on with the call on our lives. They would tell us all the things this pastor's wife and leadership were doing wrong. He would commemorate um, together, feeling hopeless in trap. So this is what it's talking about, that you're in this church, and you, you're close to the pastor, you see all these false mistakes, and you have your, your core group, your, your conflict guy, trying to persuade you to leave the church. Mm-hmm. And they're trying to say, because of this critical this deception going on with the leadership, I need you to leave the church. God called you to this, once you start your own church. Do, do things your way. You know God, I know you do that, so you're going to do it. But it all boils down to it, even though he hear them in the persuasive words, trying to deceive them and entice them to do something God didn't tell them to do. Proverbs 26, verse 20, it says, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. Where there is tail bearer, where there is no tail bearer, strife ceases. So, you got fire, like he put wood in the fire, what happened? It's a bigger, it ignites even more. Mm-hmm. But if there's no wood in the fire, eventually the fire will to cease. Yeah. And that's what it's talking about. So as these people are trying to persuade them to do this, God didn't tell them to do it. God didn't say anything. So it says, what they're saying to us may, be, may have been correct information, but it was wrong in the eyes of God because it was adding wood to the fire of offense in them as well as in us. So just because I'm offended doesn't mean I need to leave because somebody else told me to leave. Right. If God didn't tell you to leave a certain place he planted you, mm-hmm. it's not your responsibility to take decisions in the matter in your own hand right. to leave when you feel like you need to leave. Yeah. And it's God's responsibility to move you if he wants to move you. And one thing I learned from a pastor years ago when God is leading you and he tells you your seed is up in a certain place, you're going to have peace in your heart. Yeah. You're going to know the voice of God speaking to you. Yeah. You're going to have a sure word of prophecy out of the mouth of two or three witnesses that want to be established. You're going to have a confirmation That's right. of what God has spoken to you to do and then you do it. But when the enemy comes along, and try to deceive and manipulate you to do something God didn't tell you to do, it produces nothing but strife. Yes, yes. We know you are a man of God, they said. That's why we have having the problem you're having in this place. It sounds good. So one thing about it, we'll close right here. We'll pick it up next week. But one thing about it, sometimes people come to you with information that may be true, but it's not God. Because their truth is a manipulative truth. So I want to manipulate you to lead that leadership, to lead that ministry, because of the strife I have with the leader. So I might have a problem with the leader, so I want you to follow me. I've seen this happen. Where the church split, and the pastor man, and certain folk in the church, so the pastor lead, he pulled two-thirds of the whole congregation. Because he left, so he left man with him. But guess what? God still blessed the ministry. Yeah. And the ministry repaired itself, healed itself, and then became productive and began to grow. And God's anointing increased on the same ministry, where he left from. So you can't tell me that God cannot use you in a certain place when folks are mad at you. Mm-hmm. You have to learn how to recognize the voice of the enemy yes, yes. 
recognize the voice of the Lord and choose you this day whom you gonna serve. Is he gonna serve the God of the Amorites or the God of Israel? And we have to make a choice. God's our set for you life to choose the day we gonna serve. So we have to make a choice every day of your life. You have choices. But it's up to you to make a decision who you're going to serve. Just because you might have heard rumors of something going on in the house ain't right, then that's the responsibility for you to pray. That's what you need to do. He ain't say, don't talk about it. Don't be a slanderer. Don't, don't put them down. Go pray for them. Because he said, you got to bear one another's burden, lest you also be tempted in the same way. To fill the Lord Christ is best my spurs. And that's what we have to do is continue to be encouragement, not discouragement in the house of God. We're going to close right here and I'll pick it up next week. The week after we continue with the same lesson. But if you couldn't stand all over the road, look at this. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody got a question for you? Any question or comments before you go? I don't want to leave without any question. No question? No comment? You got a question? Amen. Amen.